This is Kate Blanchett, and I'm Todd Field, and we're here to answer your questions about our new movie, Tar. Well, for me, it's reconfirmed that it's filmmaking at its best is a conversation. And so the conversation with Todd was always surprising, arresting, um, provocative, hilarious. Um, there was a lot of uh, laughter. Um, but also that I, before I made a film, I used to think it was this perfect immutable thing that was just made. It was a solid object that you couldn't change. And it was the most fluid, alive process that I've ever had. And so that's something that I want to carry forward into the future, but I doubt it may ever happen again. <laughs> no, I, I feel similarly. I, I, it, this is a, it's, this was a very, very challenging film to make uh, in every respect uh, for, for all of us. And um, I think the, the, um, uh, the sort of superhuman uh, amounts of um, effort um, behind simply what, what Kate had to, to do to simply to play the role um, are, are clear. Um, but but a very very challenging uh, uh, film, um, and yes, we had we had a how do you how do you you know how do you uh, do three company moves a day and and still keep the thing alive and so it's not you know petrified wood um, because ultimately a script is is a, is a great starting point um, and. Um, you hope that that that's all it is that that, that it can become uh, more alive and uh, having a collaboration uh, a, a real collaboration uh, with someone like like Kate um, and and with Nina Haas and with Noemi Merlant and, mm. and with young Sophie Cower and uh, and 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 with Alan Corduner and and, yeah. and Julian Glover and 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 our and our incredible crew um, and just really 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 smart, um, engaged um, artists, uh, having a group of filmmakers like that and being able to still find play and still be able to ask each other questions and still be able to be fluid uh, through a process is not something I've ever experienced the likes of before. And um, uh, and I hope very much that um, uh, if I am ever to make another film that I have anything um, even approaching uh, the sort of process that we've all had together. I mean, there's something I related to that Lydia says in this long sequence where she's giving a lecture at Juilliard, where if you want to dance the mask, you must service the composer, you must subjugate yourself and your ego um, um, and, you know, to the thing that you're making. And I think that that's really important is that you have to any resonances and a residue of your own life or um, parallels to your own life that exist between you and the character will be there. Um, and I, I think you have to, to forget about that in a way and lean into the dilemma that the character finds themselves in. Um, certainly there were many questions that she was facing that I was interested in um, approaching those questions you know the character is about to turn 50 so you start thinking about time left rather than time spent you start thinking about well I'm you know she's about to hit this peak of her career you know she's about to to do something that no other conductor in our movie has done before is record um, all of Mahler's symphonies with the one orchestra um, and, and with a major um, label, she's running what is what is described in the film as the world, one of the world's greatest orchestras, um, and she has earned the right to be there. But when you get to that as as, as a creative person, what happens next? You know. Um, and so I've been thinking. You know, I'm I'm very lucky. You know, I've I have I have a I have four, four kids, and I've had a very rich career, and I'm constantly thinking. I think it's time to give it away. I think the bravest time, bravest thing I can possibly do is to stop, you know? And so it was all of those things, I think, that were al alive. But I didn't dwell on them because there was so much to do, you know? Um, and the scenes were so complex. And I often think if you're thinking about yourself in those moments, then the scenes can become very small. So, um, you know, when you look into the eyes of Nina Haas, 
you know, the world opens up. So you you have to give over. You have to give over to um, the actors that you're working with, the material that you're working on, and um, the demands of the day. Boy, that's a that's a that's a very smart question. Um, yeah, I think that that's exactly how I experienced um, uh, what Kate brought to to this role. Um, now we had been in dialogue for over a year about on a daily or semi-daily basis about uh, about the film and about the character and about very practical things about things that were um, uh, possibilities or not and planning etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but that that was all um, uh, in a certain way very practical but also academic until you're actually on the floor together and you're rehearsing together and. Uh, yes, I was surprised uh, daily by what Kate brought to this role. And I was actually surprised um, uh, well beyond production because once we got into editorial with my editor, Monica Willie, the great Monica Willie mm. um, and and her crew, um, uh, we, you know, we, we had a macro, uh, we had the, you know, you know the, the, the luxury of time in, in editorial, which you don't have in production. And so really being able to go through and really look at what Kate really did and, and the, the smallest touches that you sort of went past you um, uh, in production. So um, I, I have a very different um, evolving understanding of, uh, of the work that Kate did that I was aware of at the time, uh, and that I was completely unaware of, that um, that continues to um, uh, delight and, and surprise me, even now when I look at the film. Well, first of all, I read the script, which was incredibly rhythmic. Um, and there were obviously a lot of um, names mentioned, some that I were familiar with, um, conductors, composers, um, music critics, um, and some that I wasn't familiar with. So that was my first thing that I had to do. But I read somewhere that Simon Rattle had talked about always hearing music. And he thought that that was something that people just did. And he realized that that was not necessarily the case. So I came up with this, for better or for worse, an idea that I would have music in my ear all the time. And initially I thought, it was going to be Marla 5, it was going to be Marla 2, it was going to be Marla, 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 because that's what the character was preparing to, to uh, rehearse and perform. But that expanded very quickly. And it actually, um, a lot of uh, Goretzky I was listening to, there was one particular piece. Yeah, well, I said Goretzky, but you said Goretzky. No, it's Goretzky. Say to me. No, 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 that, no, no, I don't know, I've heard it both ways. See, we argue about a lot of things. <laughs> but the, the piece was, what was the one that had the, that we called the Tar March? Yeah, what yeah, was yeah. it called? Yeah, the, the fanta Fan fantas fantastic, um, yeah, you're, you're going to stump me, but I, yeah, I know what you're talking but about. That, but I had that piece, so I went back to, to, to him. But I also had a lot of um, uh, chants like Tibetan chants in um, in incantations because obviously she had been someone who had gone and I had a lot of Shipibo, Kinibo, Ikaro in my in my ear and then sometimes I had um, I just had a metronome beat uh, in my in my ear so I had different rhythms um, in my ear and the other one that I kept referring to was um, uh, the the Rite of Spring which mm. which is such an incredible piece of music. Um, and I think the other one that I listened to a lot was Zanakis, which was um, Alex Ross. And through a lecture I went years ago to listen to Alex Ross, I, I was introduced to Zanakis hmm. and the chaos of someone composing at the time he was composing. Um, yeah. yeah.